Scala, a.k.a. the player. I'm the co-host of the long-running Dan and Benny in the Ring podcast, as well as a weekly participant on The 30 and the Wrestling Remembered shows, all of which can be seen on Monthly and if our YouTube channel. You know, I kind of sound like the guy from uh, Simpsons. I can try the floor. And you may have seen me in adult films such as Stiff Competition. I'm hard at work, and he's holding his own. And I'm joined as always by my tr- my partner in true crime, the Boston bad girl, the siren of situate, legendary professional wrestler, Brittany Brown. Brittany, how are you doing these days? It's been a while since our last episode, but I think this one's going to be well worth the wait. Absolutely. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. And I'm so happy we're doing this one. And we have yes. some great speakers and guests on here yes, that I'm absolutely. really looking forward to talking to. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, this this episode was a long time in the making, but we're going to talk about one of the most notorious criminals in the history of the United States, James Joseph Bulger. And, you know, I've told all you guys, I knew very little about Whitey Bulger when we started doing the prep for the the show. But man, oh, man, did I uh, did I get an education? Uh, Brittany, having grown up in Boston, is quite familiar with his uh, with the man and his exploit. But with us today are two great friends who grew up in the Boston area during Whitey's reign of terror. They were both gracious enough to join us this week. Uh, first, my fellow contestant from Death 30 and a member, a panel member from our Friday night wrestling remembered show, the president of Thursday night, uh, Mr. Phil DeCessory. Phil, thanks for joining us. And uh, please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. I am. Yes, uh, I am. Um... I won in a landslide. No, uh, the president's <laughs> <on> Thursday night. <laughs> it was more a right coup. Right. <laughs> I abandoned my old country and moved into this new country. But uh, yeah, um, you know, it, it's wonderful. Um, it's great to be with you guys, first of all. You're great broadcasters. You're so knowledgeable on such a variety of subjects. So it's just a pleasure interacting and, and picking your brain and learning and just and bringing these great things to the table, you know. I've got so much in my head about Whitey Bulger. I just think it's up somewhere. So. <laughs> and to the Boston bad girl, it was it's a pleasure to meet you and already enjoy chatting with you. So this is going to oh, be fun. Oh, thank you. You too. Yeah. And we're also joined by my brother from another mother, Joe What a Day or Lowry. Joe is the host of What a Day in Centerville at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time every Wednesday night. And Joe's also a fellow contestant on The 30 and the host of Wrestling Remembered. And if they need enough for you, Joe and I are also co hosts of the uh, Line Drive Baseball podcast. Joe, how are you doing? And then uh, tell our listeners a little bit about What a Day, Joe. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe What a Day Lowry. Every day is a What a Day. And uh, you pretty much summed up my resume right there. I mean, between Monty and the Pharaoh and everything going on here in Centerville, it's uh, been kind of busy. Um, lots of stuff going on here. But as soon as I heard that you host True Crime with the lovely Brittany Brown and you were going to cover Whitey Bulger, I had to jump in because, you know, he was a fixture uh, in the Quincy and Boston area back in the day. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to get this thing going. So looking forward to it. We are glad to have you. So guys, intros out of the way. Let's get into this. Uh, Bad Girl, why don't you give our listeners a little bit of a uh, backstory on uh, Mr. Bulger? Oh, I would love to. <laughs> so James Joseph Bulger Jr. was born on September 3rd, three days after me, but many <laughs> years earlier, 1929. In Everett, Massachusetts, which is just right outside of Boston, to James Joseph Bulger Sr. and Jane Veronica Jean McCarthy. He was the second of six children. James Sr. was a longshoreman and a union laborer who lost his arm in an industrial accident and was limited in his future employment. As a result, the family was reduced to poverty, sadly. In 1938, when Whitey was nine, the family moved to subsidized housing to South West, also known as Southie. This is where Whitey grew up. Now, Phil, can you give our listeners a brief geography lesson and tell everybody what Southie is, really? You know, I know I know a little bit about it, and I know that Joe is definitely the the expert. I'll see my little and I know he wants to jump in. Um, it's interesting. It, where um, Whitey grew up really was such an Irish enclave in these projects. And um, it seems that we've seen generations of poverty here. Um, 
it's located <laughs> relatively close. It's near the ocean, which is very the Atlantic Ocean, which is very fitting because White ended up being captured in California by the Pacific Ocean. But I think White's universe really it revolved around maybe one mile radius, and certainly gently a little more beyond. But John Conley um, lived right near recently. One of his girlfriends lived. I mean, we're talking on a still sometimes 800 feet away or you know, a half a mile away. So it really was a condensed area. And you'll see in his story how this is kind of important, approximately close. He was, you know, to his family and um, business associates. So it really is. It's, it's a condensed area, I think. And I know Jim, for particularly maybe about the quality area beyond South and some of the other areas that do a little. Yeah, um, well, South Boston, basically, south of Boston and so forth. It is sandwiched between Quincy and Boston. I grew up in Quincy, which is eight miles south of Boston. Actually, I went to school at North Quincy High. Whitey Bulger lived both of his life in Quincy um, at the condominiums there on Commander State Boulevard. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but I keep forgetting because I think they switched hands since then. But uh, his yeah. playground was, you know, they called it the burial ground. That was uh, under the Neponset River Bridge which is the bridge that, um, you know, they say one way in, one way out. That's the bridge that connects actually Quincy to Dorchester slash Boston slash Southie. Uh, the train goes over that way as well, too. But uh, we'll come to find out later on that that bridge is pretty famous. Um, I, I know, um, Betty, you watched Black Bass last night, and, you know, there was that that burial ground that they talk about, and that is in Quincy. Oh, yeah. Saw that. Um, yep. It's right on the river there. Um I do recall coming back from my honeymoon in 2000, August of 2000, uh, I used to work in the Marina Bay area and the roads are blocked off because they started digging up bodies. Uh, they started finding out that that's where a lot of this stuff was, a lot of the secrets were kept. And um, the development projects, Boston wanted to start developing that area. Quincy wanted to start developing that area now. Um, as you know, it's a booming place now, but they had to start clearing that place out and, you know, timing's everything. And they started digging up and they, they found some stuff there. So and I'm sure yeah. we'll capitalize on that later on. But Quincy, oh, Boston, yeah, it, go, it goes Quincy, Dorchester, Southie, Boston, all within eight miles of each other. Everybody knows each other. You know, it's just it's it's, it's a close knit community. That's for sure. Nice. So uh, Whitey had a couple of younger brothers, John and uh, William. Now, they excelled in academics, but Whitey was drawn to life in the streets. Um, he actually received the nickname Whitey from the local police because of his hair color. Uh, and Whitey apparently hated that name. He liked to be called Jim, Jimmy, or Boots uh, because of his predilection for cowboy boots, which yeah. he wore to hide his uh, switchblade. So whether you want to call him Jim, Whitey, Jimmy, or Boots, it didn't take him long to be on a first name uh, basis with the Popo. He was arrested for the first time in 1943 at the age of 14 after he was charged with uh, larceny. Um, he was sent to a juvenile reformatory, and after his release, he joined the United States Air Force. Uh, he did receive an honorable discharge in 1952, but he did spend some time in uh, military prison, uh, both for uh, assaults as well as going AWOL. And uh, he did return to Boston after his discharge. So Joe is going to take us through his early adult life as he started a 40 plus year criminal career, uh, culminating with him becoming the most wanted man in America. Now, I'm the most wanted man in America at the present time for entirely different reasons. That's on Thursday nights. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, uh, why do you initially started tailgating or as we like to call it, robbing delivery trucks? Um, after they picked up their merchandise from the pier. Now, from there, he went on to armed robbery, which led to his arrest in 1956. He got sent to Atlanta Penitentiary, where he was... Uh, this is where the story gets a little crazy, because he volunteered, uh, volunteered to be included in an experiment, as well as 18 other uh, inmates. Uh, it was I think it was an FBI-type or a government-sponsored type thing where they experimented with LSD and psychedelic drugs over an 18-month period. Um, it was... To, supposedly to find a cure for schizophrenia, while in reality, the experiments were related to mind control. Um, one of the things um, that's funny is he was transferred to Alcatraz in 1959. And the reason he was transferred to Alcatraz is because they didn't have solitary confinement in Atlanta because he attempted to escape Atlanta prison so many times 
they transferred him. Um, so, of course, you know, he took up weightlifting when he got to Alcatraz and so forth. Now, I did take a couple of notes on this. And believe it or not, let me just pull it up here. Uh, Balju was transferred from Atlanta to Alcatraz because he attempted to escape prison so many times. Once Balju was, uh, did his term in Alcatraz in July of 62, it was only one month later that the great escape from Alcatraz happened. And he was a one-time close associate of Frank Morris, who is one of the prisoners that escaped Alcatraz. I just thought that was interesting. He yeah. leaves, he gets transferred from Atlanta for trying to break out too many times. He goes to Alcatraz, does his time, and is, you know, one month be- after he leaves, the great escape happens. I don't know. Coincidence? You tell me. But that's pretty I don't interesting. Know about that. Yeah, there. that's interesting. So that was that was kind of that was kind of crazy. But um, his um, reading in prison, he read a lot about politics and military history, and of course, we'll get into the pol- political side of things with his brother later on. So yeah. here we are with him. All right, that was great, Joe. So <laughs> he was uh, eventually transferred to Leavenworth, and then in 1963 to Lewisburg Federal Pen, where he was paroled in 1965. So after serving a total of nine years in prison, so so bad girl, he, he, Joe said he took a correspondence course in bookkeeping, so he got out and became a bookkeeper, right? No. <laughs> very close, my player, very close. Uh, a bookmaker. A bookmaker uh, a and a loan shark, to be exact. He also became a member of the Killeens, and I think I'm saying that right, you guys. You are. Okay. Yeah. They dominated the South Boston crime scene for decades. The Killeens were led by three Killeen brothers, Donnie, Kenny, and Eddie. And their base of operation was the Transit Cafe, which later became Triple O's, which I think all of us know. Um, (laughs) Joel, Phil, have you, either of you ever been to Triple O's? Yes, I have. I have not. Not that I remember. I've been around there. (laughs) Many yeah. places I've been to, or so I've heard, but it yeah. it didn't look like much of a place, Joe. It looked like a dive, is it? Yeah, it, it it was. It was your typical South Boston bar room. It was over on West Broadway, across from Broadway train station, the MBTA station. Uh, when I first turned 21, 1991, I was out there, and of course, as a young kid, you want to go try every place imaginable. And I do recall going to Triple O's. I do recall seeing them in the corner. Didn't think nothing of it. Didn't know who he was until later on. But my only memory of that place really was going there for last call, one, two in the morning, and two girls broke out in a beer bottle fight, and they got thrown out the back door. Um, So here I am, young 21-year-old kid, and, and, you know, looking at the situation going, wow, this is kind of a neat place. But lo and behold, it became a historical site now. I think it's called the the Rack and Knife or something like that. It's a yuppie uh, bar now. They did it over. The knife and fork restaurant, knife and bo- box and knife restaurant, or something like that. But uh, uh, that's yeah. Triple O's was not the place to hang out at, um, <laughs> especially after eleven o'clock at night. <laughs> wow. I'm yeah. thinking of uh, when you said that. I was thinking of there was a uh, uh, there was a bar fight on uh, WWE TV between Tony Gurria and Terry Funk. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Long time ago. I don't know why I thought of that. Of course, because you know we always think about wrestling, right? We certainly so, do. Eventually, the Colleen's and the rival gang, the Mullins, got together, and um, they got tired of killing each other, I guess, and decided to unite and form the Winter Hill Gang. So Whitey was now in his early 40s, became, becomes the uh, the crime kingpin of uh, South Boston, and his involvement encompasses bookmaking, loan sharking, no bookkeeping, though, even though he took that correspondence course, and uh, drug dealing. And if there was any criminal activity going on, the odds on were that Bulger was getting a piece of the action. Now, we could go on about Whitey and his criminal activities until tomorrow morning. It would be only touching the uh, the proverbial tip of the iceberg uh, regarding this guy. But for the rest of the episode, we're going to have each of our esteemed panel talk about various aspects of the man's life. Uh, we'll each, uh, they'll also each start with a brief statement, and Joe kind of touched on it, on what it was like growing up in Boston uh, during the Whitey Bulger era. Bad girl, let's start with you. Um, how about Whitey's reputation as a womanizer? He had two long-term relationships, but then he also fathered a, fathered a child with a third woman. Yeah, crazy. And, you know, I did not know that until I saw Black Mass. 
Yeah. I didn't know about the third woman or the child until I saw Black Mass, and I was absolutely shocked how well hidden that was until that movie came out. Very, very surprised. And I also want you guys to know a little bit off topic, but what you just said, um, barroom scene with Terry Funk, guess where that was taped? Talk about a small world. Tim White's bar, two miles down the road from my house. Wow. Where was that, Brady? Where was it? Two miles away from me, the Friendly Tap. In oh, the Friendly Road. Tap. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Nice. That's where all the bar so cool. scenes were taped. Oh, so, wow. A, a little 